breathing, hallelujah. That autonomic nervous system, you don't have to conjure up the thought and the will to breathe. He just makes it happen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. Those heartbeats that you take for granted. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Every week you have more than one million reasons to thank God. Hallelujah. That's before he put food on your table. That's before he, he put a roof over your head. That's before he made your car start. That's before he does all those other things. You have more than a million reasons to thank your God. Hallelujah. And he gave you hands that you could clap. He gave you a voice that you could praise with. Isn't God good? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Preserve your voice, Pastor. I don't know how. I don't know how. Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Man, I need, eventually, I'll learn to preserve my energy and my voice. Eventually, I guess. Amen. And praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord, saints. Don't make me keep going. Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord, saints. Hallelujah. We need to make the angels jealous. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. It is so good to be in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. I am happy to be in the presence of his saints. I am happy to have the opportunity to praise him so much that he, he can't resist to bring his presence. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And I want to welcome everyone who is with us online. You could have been anywhere. We thank you for joining us and we pray that you will be blessed by something that happens during this time that you join us here virtually. We are also still praying for those who are on our prayer list. Amen. So if you have someone that you've submitted, know that we are standing in the gap. Know that we don't remain idle. Know that they are not forgotten. Know that we care with our hearts. Amen. And we appeal to the heart of God on their behalf and we accept his perfect will. Amen. We serve a sovereign God. And so we're just grateful that you have bonded with us and entrusted us to pray for your loved ones or pray for you. Amen. To intercede on your behalf. Well, I, I'm, I'm very happy. I want to make sure I get this right. I think evangelist hooks and deacon hooks. Amen. Vivian and Gilbert. Did I get it right? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You must be special because I don't always get it right. <laughs> Amen. 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 Those aren't just titles. When I hear those titles, I think about the work. When I hear those roles, I think about the work. When I hear those words, I think about the commitment. I think about the hands of the body of Christ. I think about all of the inner workings of it and how you play your part. Hallelujah. Let's thank the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because the harvest is plenty. But the laborers are few. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. So we want to welcome you. My wife has already welcomed you, but I want to welcome you on my own behalf. Amen. For the whole For God's Glory Ministries family. We thank you for joining us. We thank you for being with us. And I pray that something has already happened that has blessed you. And Pastor Trina built me up a little bit and talked about the word. Just know today it's going to be simple and straightforward. I might not even mention Greek and Hebrew. How's that? I might not <laughs> go to the Greek and the Hebrew this morning. Because what are we doing this last, last week and this week? We're talking about the foundation. The foundation. We can add to it. We can build on it. But we're talking about the thing that undergirds it all. Amen? Hallelujah. So I do have a word. And just before we get to that word, I have two things to say. First of all, one I'll call good news. The other one I'll call bad news. So I won't ask you, what do you want first, the good news or the bad news? Because I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's good bad news. Amen? Is there such a thing as good bad news? So the first thing is, my heart's breaking. I'm getting palpitations, trying to catch my breath. Because our dear Johnny... Is going to Alabama. (laughs) 
You know, I had nothing against Alabama up to this point. <laughs> and yet I'm feeling some kind of way about Alabama. <laughs> but really, that's just to remind me, to remind you on all of our behalf how much we are we feel privileged and we're grateful for your presence, for your fellowship, for being amongst us, being with us, being in this thing with us, for real, for all the right reasons. We are so grateful that you chose to make this the place that you come to be fed and to fellowship and to meet God and to do God's work and love on God's people. Amen. So let's just give the Lord a hand praise. Amen. Hey, man, oh, we just, you just don't know. Hey, man, you're just being you. You're just being you, that God made you to be, but it's just a blessing. It's just a blessing, and we're just so grateful and just want to stop and, and say thank you, God, for our, our sister Johnny. Hey, man, I'm not saying your whole name because you might not want your business out there. So I'm just saying, Johnny, how's that? You have to have discretion. It's not easy being up here, amen? Everything you say is scrutinized. It's, now it's recorded. It's even censored. How about that? How about that? Face live, Facebook Live? Oh, yeah, don't say the wrong thing now. What? Don't even let their automated systems think you said the wrong thing. They will boot you off. We know that. We've learned. Amen. You don't have to say something wrong. Amen. The little robot just needs to think you said something wrong. Hallelujah. But we are just so grateful. And I'm grateful that I get the opportunity to stop and just thank God. Amen. How you like the good, bad news? <laughs> and we pray for your safe travels. We trust that you'll still be joining us virtually. But now you know just how much we care about having you here physically. Amen. Amen. I'm going to have to have you sit up here closer. I want you to run out the back door and start get an early start. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now you ready for the good news? Yeah. Amen. I'm going to ask Brother Marcellus to project something here behind me, if he would. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Oh, yes. Can you see that? Yeah. Our work. Oh, yes. Our own. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. That's right. That's right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Go around. You go and give him some high fives. That's all right. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah, go on and give those high fives. <laughs> Amen. Amen. If you're a germaphobe, there's some germicide or jelly in the, in, right in the, in the front there in the vestibule. Feel free. I'll give you time. If you need to cleanse your hands, go ahead and do that. Amen. Our own. God's own. Hallelujah. Sister Linda Crawford Fields. Oh, yeah, look at that number. If you, if you look carefully, see, you can't see it. It's a little blurry, but that bottom, I can't, I'm, not, I'm not tall enough to reach all the way up there. But there was, she was number 746. That means there's at least 746 entries. Now, there are many categories, but in the category of a single layer cake, because the layered cakes had a different category, there was only one person that could give first place. Come on now. Come on now. Our own. So now you, she's already calling it the best cake in the world. It's already won awards in San Bernardino County. Now she done conquered Los Angeles County. How about that? How about that? Come on, county of counties, okay? Amen, amen, amen. And we got to go. We went to the fair and took those pictures. We went back again. But this time, we got to be the second time. We got to be with the celebrity. With the celebrity. Amen. I didn't show you the pictures of the pastor grinning up there pointing to the cake alongside the celebrity. Amen. Come on now. now so, so now if she flosses a little bit, 
if she flosses a little bit and start talking about her best cake in the world, you just gonna have to back on up. You gonna just have to back on up. Come on now, cause listen, her, her son knows. I, I, I was just excited. I said, look, and little ones, I want you to hear this now. You gonna get some. You gonna get some credit from me. Ain't nobody give her that. Nobody give her that. She had to decide to enter. Accept God's grace to do it. She had to tell the folks she wanted to enter. She had to make that cake and she had to take it down there, go through all those steps. A lot of folks would have stopped somewhere in between. But she finished the race. She finished the race. So you get props from me. You handled the business. Now, now we don't want to get too haughty. We don't want to let you guys think that pride, because pride comes before fall. But I'm just going to say she called her shot. She called her shot because she told all she could have done it secretly and only told you about it after she got first place. But she told all of y'all, she told me, I'm entering my world's best cake into the L.A. County Fair competition. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So I just I'm excited. How you like the good, good news? Amen. All right. OK. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look, we are here to glorify the Lord, but we are also here to fellowship. Amen. We are here to show God how much we love him. Amen. And how grateful we are for his love in us. But we are also here to love on each other, Amen. to appreciate one another. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So, oh, by the way. The celebrity, she's there next to her cake. And some other folks walk up, these two people, that just happened to be from ranch. A lot of weird things happened that day. We going into the parking lot, the parking lot was full, and so we had to go into the special parking lot. The guy let us in the special parking lot, and we get out of the car, and Pastor Trina looks at this guy, and they both say, you must be from Rancho Cucamonga, because I just saw you this morning. She went to the grocery store but before we went to the fair, and we run into, we park right next to the person she saw at the the odds, the odds, Amen. come on now. Anyway, I digress. So we're there and she's standing next to her cake and some folks come over and they're talking about the cake and they're talking about the first prize and they're talking about the person as if they're just, you know, an imaginary person. She said, that's me. They said, what? They got to be there with the, I'm, I'm, I'm standing here with the person. How many of you all know she got an order? <laughs> she got an order from somebody who lives here in Red Show Cucamonga. So you know what's going to happen when that domino hits the next domino, hits the next domino, hits the next domino. Somebody else that you don't even know is going to run into you. You're gonna, they're going to tell you about this amazing cake. And you're going to say, oh, I know. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. So if she flosses, don't be, don't be a hater. Don't be a hater. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. So I'm so glad I got to give you that good news. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, I do have a word this morning. I told you it's going to be straightforward, simple. I might not even get into the Greek and the Hebrew. I might not. But last week, um, evangelists and deacon, we... Uh, we learned just how big a deal Jesus' message was and is. Amen. Amen? Amen? How big a deal it was, the sacrifice that he made, and how high the stakes are for us. This is not just some nice historical fact. It's not just some, you know, thing that you can put in the margin of your notes of your life how big a deal it is for every single person that has ever lived on this earth. How big a deal it is. Amen. Well, today, last week, we focused on Jesus' part of the equation. And today, we're going to look at the other side of the equation, which is how people respond to that message. How people respond to that sacrifice and why? Because you see this Bible? It's a big Bible, right? 66 books, a whole lot of words, all kind of promises, 
all kind of stories, all kind of amazing people, and one true and living God. And out of all this, there is nothing more important than Jesus' work coming down here, dealing with this earth, giving his life, and then man's response to it. I'm going to say that again. We could talk about a lot of stuff. We could talk about miracles. We could talk about healing. We could talk about all kind, all sorts of stuff in here. Amen? Amen? From the Torah, the Pentateuch. We could talk about things from the historical books. We could talk about things from the poetic books. We could talk about things from the, the, uh, 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 the, the, the prophetic books. We can get into the Gospels, as we are in John. We could talk about the letters from Paul and others. We can get to Revelation, and there will be no subject more important, more foundational, more vital, so that as you walk around being light and salt, you better have this thing down because this world is going away from God. You must have this thing more than any other thing clear Amen. in your mind. Amen. Nothing is more critical than Jesus' message and his sacrifice and our response. And if you individualize it, personalize it, and you should, all of you out there and everybody in here under the sound of my voice, there's nothing more important. You may be thinking about your money is funny. You may be thinking about something's going on wrong with your house. You may be thinking about that next promotion you want. You may be thinking about anything. There's nothing more important, nor will there ever be anything more important in your life than Jesus' work on the cross, his message, and your individual response, no matter where you are when you hear this message, your response to that message. What you do with Jesus is the most important thing that's ever going to matter in your life and throughout eternity. Amen. Jesus could drop the mic, not me, right there. But I do have a message. And so in terms of a title for this message, as we talked about last week, the gospel and man's response to it, part two. The gospel, see how I told you it's going to be straightforward, simple, uh, deacon and evangelist. The gospel and man's response to it, part two. And if I had a secondary, and, and, and on the title, Brother Marcellus, feel free to put a colon there and just say, guilty by choice. The gospel and man's response to it, part two, subtitle, Guilty by choice. Let's pray for a second. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this gathering. We thank you so much for your presence. Lord God, in advance, we thank you for speaking through me, Lord God, your humble servant. Lord, help us, Lord God, to hear your words and to be good, new wineskins, Lord God, and to hear it and to absorb it and accept it, Lord God, and have it work in us. And after it's done that work, help us, Lord God, to, to remember it. Help us, Lord God, to be able to recall it in the moment that we need to bless someone else with it. We thank you in advance for all of these blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen. So our text will be found in the, the book of John. Are you surprised? <laughs> the gospel of John. We are still there. Hallelujah. And we are in chapter 3. And it just doesn't get any more foundational than this. So thank God, I thank the Lord that Nicodemus, you know, got real uh, bold enough, although he was still trying to do it on the down low, to go over to Jesus, being one of the leaders of the Sanhedrin, and, and, to, and to say, hey, Jesus, what's up, man? I, I need to understand this. I don't want all my buddies to know I'm here, but I want to understand. And this all came because Jesus responded to a question. Hallelujah. John 3.16, probably the most well-known uh, uh, verse in all of the Bible among Christians and non. And we are here learning at the foot of Jesus. Amen? Amen. From the context of it. Amen. Oh, that's so awesome. Hallelujah. And so we will be covering today verses 9 through, 19 sorry, through 21. But by way of review, if we go back to John 3 and 16, that famous verse, we see and we come to understand that Jesus came and he died to offer us, not to make us, 
We are not automatons. We are not robots. Amen. God gave us a free will, a choice to love him, to obey him. And so he died to offer us the better side of Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 is where that great white throne judgment will occur. Amen. We don't see it now. Oh, but it's coming. And so he offered us the opportunity to not have that be the worst day of our existence because that's possible without him. As a matter of fact, it's guaranteed without him. And so he came and he died to give us the opportunity to, to have the better side of that event and to have, as a result of that event, eternal life of joy with him. Amen. If you belong to Jesus, that ought to sound like music to your ears. Amen. You should be saying, Pastor, sing it because I hear the music. He paid the price. For you to have that eternal joy. Guess what? If you're saved, raise your hand. And if you're saved, guess what? We already have it. You can party right now. You can party right now. He came to make that possible. And in verse 17, again, by way of review, I just want to point out that, you know, we use saved and salvation like little catchphrases, a catchword, little tagline in Christianity. But just let me tell you, salvation is not just some religious concept. Because as a result of your choice, you either get to have a good time after Revelation 20 or you get, whoa, the other side. The point being, yes, you're saved to something, eternal joy and being in the presence of God with Jesus in the new Jerusalem, being the light, needing no sun, no more tears, no more sorrow, no more pain. We can keep going. But you're also saved from something. Mm -hmm. It may not even make sense. Well, I'm saved too. No, but you save when you save somebody, it means they, they're in trouble, right? If there's somebody from the water, it means they might drown, right? You save your child from getting, getting hit by a car by pulling them, snatching them out of the street, amen? amen? Salvation is not just a little Christian religious concept. When you get saved, you got saved from something. It's not just a generalizable concept. If you're not saved, that means you're in trouble. You're still in the depths of the water and the water is swirling and the undertow is pulling you down. Salvation is real. So you get that concept in your mind. Salvation is real. And there's a real, very real and eternal suffering and separation from God that awaits you as a date in the future unless you accept Jesus' is offer, amen? amen? Again, more mic dropping. <laughs> Hallelujah. Not trying to be a downer. This is just the truth. I'm just taking it right here from the word. And it's all in red. Jesus speaking, amen? amen? So now, that brings us to verse 18, just before our text for this morning. Word reads, he that believeth on him, that is on Jesus, is not what? Condemned. Not condemned. But he that believeth not is what? Amen. Condemned already. And did we not break that down? Amen. Amen? Amen? Speaking about a future event in time, but with the, you know, an event whose effect is actually happening now, even if it doesn't feel like it or look like it as a result of a choice that you made in the past and continue to make up to your present moment. Amen? So those who do not accept and believe in and embrace Jesus, they are already condemned. Why did Jesus say this? He said it because he's trying to help you to understand 
I did not come here to judge you or condemn you. I came here to save you. If I just watch, you're going to drown. You're already drowning. I don't have to help you drown. I don't have to wag my finger about why did you get in the water. You, you already drowning. I came to save you. I came to get in there with you and pull you out. I came to at least throw you a lifeline. So those who do not believe on him, they are already condemned. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So what do we note here as we get ready to go into our text? We see here Jesus admitting the creator of the universe. Amen? The word. Nothing was created without him. He is admitting after going through all that he went through. He's admitting that some people will not, and frankly, most people will not embrace his sacrificial gift. Jesus admitting that despite having done what he did, he's admitting that there are those who will not believe on his name. And for those who do not, their future condition is already in place. It's already at work. It's already true. Amen? Amen. By the choice that they've made to continue and continue to make not to embrace and follow Jesus Christ. So today we're going to address now having absorbed this by way of review, we're going to address the issue of why. What's man's response, which Jesus is here admitting that some will not embrace him, and we're going to talk about why. Amen? Amen. And this is important to do, this is important to know, this is important to understand because we are managing to somehow live in a world that's moving further and further away from God. So it's helpful to understand before you try to offer them what God has given you to give them to understand why they do what seems to make no sense to us. To understand that it is true that not all will embrace Jesus, but in Jesus' own words, we're going to understand the why. Is that all right? And so as we approach this question, this issue that is so critical to understand, I want to point out the fact that this is our, this is our reality here. And I, Marlene, I'll just tell you, I thought about you when I, when, I, when I was thinking about this. Our default programming, it was great programming to start with. The software was functioning beautifully. We had everything that we could ever want until Eve clicked on the link. <laughs> and initiated a, a domino effect that spiraled into having the malware affect our programming. We are permanently defective. Our programming, the default programming, is for destruction. Did you know that? I know when the cute little ones come out and they're just beautiful, they're gorgeous, they're our precious ones, we welcome them into the world with celebration, with smiles. And as they grow up, we love them. But we, we also know, the grown-ups, we know what kind of world they came into. We protect them from it. And when it comes time, we try to teach them how to extricate themselves from this world that seems to be just, just sure it wants to go to hell. Just wants to, seems like. But our default programming is toward destruction. So doesn't that sound like a situation where you, that you need to be saved from? Yeah. Moreover, more importantly, doesn't that sound like a situation you would want to be saved from? Yeah. And yet, not all want it. So ultimately, as we prepare to get into this word, I just want to leave a, a couple little points that I want you to keep in the back of your mind, okay? You crystallize it all into this. Before Jesus, because of our programming, we were guilty by association. But after Jesus, we are guilty by choice. That's simple. 
before Jesus, without Jesus, we were all guilty. The law was there to show us that you can do it over and over and over and over again. It's never going to be enough. So wouldn't you be happy that he gave one sacrifice to end all that? Or do you really want to keep being reminded over and over and over again about your faulty programming and your faulty father? who went down into the depths of, of sin because of the father of lies. Is that where you want to live? Is that what you want to wake up to every morning? Or would you be happy that the creator said, I'll come and solve it? And wouldn't you be grateful and ready to embrace that? But not everybody. And yet the truth remains, before Jesus we were guilty by association, that's forgivable. But after Jesus, and that's our existence, we are here after Jesus. And by the way, we, we, we're not getting into it today, but we can explain how Jesus and his blood and his presence and his work and his message applies to all of those that came before him. So don't get that twisted. I don't want to leave you with a dangling participle in your mind, but what about all the people before Jesus? covered it all. Amen? Because all of those who were really in God, who knew God, who confessed God, who served God, were all looking for this Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on now. We can shout all day long. Hallelujah. So after Jesus or with Jesus, once you come to the light of Jesus, all of those who come after him have that opportunity. All of those who come before him, I mean, look at Hebrews 11. They were looking toward a city. They knew this was not their home. They wished they could actually live in the day when the Savior came. So those who choose not to put their trust in Jesus, they have a very bad outcome. In the end. Hallelujah. And yet, while we're down here, those people, maybe some of you are here today, maybe some of you are, I hope not, but listening or watching online at some point, whenever that day comes that you're watching. I know it doesn't seem like it. If you don't accept Jesus, you have a very bad outcome. Read Revelation chapter 20. But I know it doesn't seem like it right now. It even seems like sometimes those who haven't accepted Jesus, those who don't have the understandable restrictions, the rights and the wrongs, that those who are not committing their lives, their time, their energy, their resources to the work of God, amen, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Christ, they seem to be doing even better than us, it seems. And those who compromise the gospel message. Those who take a detour, a wrong turn, and yet stand in the pulpit, sometimes they seem to have a bigger house and a better car than the one who's preaching the truth. So it seems with our eyes and our emotions and our circumstances, it looks like you don't end up with a really bad outcome without Jesus. Are you with me? Because God continues to send the rain uh, for sinners and saints alike. So now, are you ready to dive into the issue? Is that enough preamble? Are you prepared? Are you primed? Are you, are you ready? Are you pumped for the word? So let's go to begin our text. We find it here in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 19. Whereas we're talking about, we've been talking about the work of Jesus, the presence of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus, the message of Jesus, and man's response. And Jesus admitting himself that some will not embrace him or his message, and he highlighted uh, they've got trouble coming. So verse 19, I'm just going to read the very first part for a second. And this is what? The condemnation. So he just said, those who don't accept Jesus, those who accept him, woo, hallelujah, let's party. Those who don't, they are, I didn't come to condemn them. I came with a gift. I came happy to, with an open hand, an open heart, ready to go on the cross on, in their behalf, in their stead. But some 
will not accept it. And they are already condemned. And I didn't come to condemn you. Jesus did not come to condemn or to judge. He came to save. Yet, however, there is an indictment and there is a conviction. Just, just so we get this straight. So he says, after saying all of that, and this is the condemnation. This is the judgment. I didn't come to judge, but if you choose not to accept the gift that I offer, here is what the judge, ain't no jury. Here's what the judge will say. Now remember, Jesus didn't come to judge, but here is what the judge will say. That light is coming to the world. And in your case, light is come into your life. And men what? Loved darkness rather than light. This is the judgment. This is what you are guilty of. This is what your sentence is based on. This is the offense that you brought upon others. And now you have to pay the price as a result. The light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than the light. Uh, imagine. And then it says, ah, uh, we'll come to it in a second. But that light is coming to the world and men love darkness more than the light. That light came to offer us a rescue, offer us preservation, offer us healing, spiritual healing, and to show us the way. That's what the light's agenda was and is. But who wants to be rescued if they don't think they have any trouble? Who wants to be rescued if things seem okay? If I come and you're trying to swim in the water and you know how to swim and you got this and I come over there grabbing on you, you're going to be upset with me, right? Makes it harder for you to swim. But if you're drowning and you know it, then you're going to be happy, amen? amen? Happy that I made the sacrifice. Happy that I got into the situation with you. Happy that you're probably better off with me than without me. Happy because you were destined for drowning for sure without me. Amen. Even on the off chance I might help you, you happy that I'm there. But some don't feel like they're in trouble. And who wants to be healed if you're not sick? Who wants to take medicine with potential side effects and it might even taste nasty if you have no illness? And so that brings us to the last part of this verse. This is the indictment. This is the judgment. Jesus didn't come to bring this into play, but it was already at work. We are programmed for it. Amen? Amen. He says, because their deeds were what? Evil. Evil. Hallelujah. Now, we might want to give them the benefit of the doubt. Say, well, if they knew better, if they heard the truth, if the situation, because we, we're going to really see what, we, there's going to be no excuses by the time we're done here. Amen? Amen. He says, they love the darkness more than the light. We're just sang a song talking about Jesus brings darkness into light. Uh, darkness, he brings the light into darkness. And they love darkness rather than the light. Now, if you, I said I wouldn't go to the Greek and the Hebrew, but I found myself about to do it. Right. Let me just say that the ultimate effect here is black and white binary, zeros and ones. I'm still thinking about your pro, my pro, computer person. Even if you say, well, you know, Jesus is pretty cool. I, I can go so far. I believe that probably happened. I can kind of roll with him, man. He's useful. I don't not believe that he existed. I, 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 that's fine. He's, he can, you can even say, fine, he's the Savior. But I'm not drowning. The Bible here says the condemnation is that the light came in. 
and we love the darkness rather than the light. What am I trying to get to you? Because that sounds so binary. If you, ah, I said I wouldn't do it. Let me just say this. He loved darkness more than the light. I'm still trying to avoid that Greek. He loved darkness. Men love darkness more than the light. What am I saying? You're going to run into folks. They're not going to say Jesus is terrible. They're just going to decide that they don't need him. They love darkness more than the light. What am I trying to say? That people, despite the word of truth coming into their life, despite the sacrifice that Jesus made, despite the truth, and the, it's the only truth is the truth that he brought, people will still want to do, they will love the darkness more than the light because they will still want to do the stuff that they want to do. This is Jesus talking. This is not Pastor Mike making this up. Jesus saying, why will the indictment hold? Why will the guilty verdict be brought down? Why? Because the light was offered. The light came in. The light was shown. The truth was offered. But men preferred the darkness over light. But why would you prefer darkness? If I came into your house and it was dark because your light bill wasn't paid, wouldn't you be happy if I found a way to turn it on legally? But guess what? If I rolled up on you and you didn't expect me in particular, there's some situations you wouldn't want the light to be turned on. You know why? Because of what you're doing in the dark. Mm -hmm. You don't want light shown on. Uh, what if I came and, sh uh, uh, and shown a light on your finances? Uh-huh. Yeah. What if I came and shown a light on your internet searches? Oh, we, we like the light. The light has come. Uh-huh. But we, we, you might, you might not want the light, right? Because you, not, here's the thing, not, ooh, let me just finish breaking it down. Okay. Get ahead of myself. I always, people that know me say, know a saying that I have. What is it, what is it, people that know me? People always do what they really want to do. And people will say, well, wait a minute, there's some things I do I don't feel like doing. But, but why, do you, why, do you, why do you do it, even though you don't feel like doing it? Because it's something else. That matters more. And that's the thing you want to do because that's ultimately the thing you decided was the most important. So you'll do the thing you don't even feel like doing because something else matters to you. So you are always doing the thing that you really want to do. That's just the way we're built. Amen. But here we're saying, Jesus is saying that people want to keep on doing the things that they've been doing. People want to keep on being the things that they, the way that they have been being. The light has come. Oh, the truth. Oh, my goodness. The repentant heart says, oh, I am so sorry. You got me. And yet some will see that light differently. Will have a bias, a negative bias toward the light because their deeds are evil or bad. And they want to keep on doing it. The Bible. Jesus. Jesus just said it. So, so we give them the benefit of the doubt and say, well, if they knew better, guess what? There's many. It doesn't matter because they want to keep on doing their stuff. Here's the thing again. If you, if the light came and your stuff started getting shown, you could just say, oh, my God, you got me. But no, I want to keep on doing what I've been doing. I want to keep on being what I've been being. And as long as there's no immediate palpable negative outcome, seems good to me. I'm rolling better than you, Christians. Then I'm going to just keep on doing what I've been doing. I hear your truth. Listen to me now. Contemporary. I'm all the way up here to the millennials time. Uh, uh, I have, we all have our truth. Ah, speak your truth, right? I, you got your truth. I got my truth. This, but the Bible talks about the truth. Amen. The first trick in the Bible, there was the truth, which Adam and Eve were told. Adam was told, and Adam told Eve. And what, what is the first trick he played? 
mess with, there is a truth. <laughs> he backed her, backed out her to back off of the truth. And he offered them, offered her a truth that was in competition with the truth. And instead of checking with the author, she went with the thing that she wanted to do. And the rest is history. And then Adam, same thing. She offered him a truth, which included, hey, I'm still alive. And that's in competition with what Adam was told, which was the truth. And Adam also even more guilty, being the first one that was told directly from God, chose to go with a truth instead of the truth. Foundation. This is still foundation. Ain't nothing fancy about this. All foundation. The unrepentant man will do what his flesh desires, carrying on with all the things that the world offers as long as he doesn't feel or see or sense any immediate consequences. It seems like we can just skip through life on our own terms, amen? Are you hearing me? Amen. Hallelujah. And so we carry on with life on our own terms. The wisdom and the knowledge and the enlightenment of God is available. But we choose the wisdom and knowledge and enlightenment of this generation of mankind. We choose the wisdom, the knowledge, and the enlightenment of the internet. We choose the wisdom and, and, and knowledge and enlightenment of those who want to live pluralistically and not have one God, one sovereign, one truth. We all get to have one sailing along full steam ahead on what you think is the unsinkable ship of your will. But it's not so. And so now we look at the next few verses, next couple verses, just to make it clear that this is a conscious, active, and personal decision that you're accountable for. We look at verses 20 and 21. For everyone that doeth evil, hates the light. Neither cometh to the light, meaning comes toward the light. Everyone who's doing stuff that they know they shouldn't be doing, but they want to keep on doing it, they move away from the light. Lest what? His deeds should be Reproved. And I'm going to have to go to a little Greek in a second. Amen? Amen? But he that doeth truth comes toward the light. Amen? Amen? Comes toward the light that his deeds may be made manifest, that may be made known, may be made visible, just the opposite of the person who's doing the bad stuff. Maybe made manifest that they are wrought in God. So I'm just, I, I, what I want to make sure that you are aware of is this word reprove. We know what that means. You're going to get in trouble, right? You're going to be scolded. It's going to be determined. You're going to know that you did something wrong. We're not just going to gloss over it. That word reproved means it's, it, it has a com combination meaning. It, it means it implies that the thing isn't just reprovable, isn't, you're not just convicted of it, but that it is exposed. It's important that it is exposed because that's what the light does. Amen? The light exposes it. And so he that doeth truth comes toward that light, but he that does not do truth, he that embraces evil and keeps on doing it because that's what he wants to do, he doesn't want any parts of that light because the light exposes, which then leads to reproof. So they're not just avoiding, it's not just meta melomai. it's not just they're avoiding the repentance that comes from, oh, I'm busted. 
but you run from the light because you don't want your stuff in, exposed in the first place because you know what comes after that. Self-preservation. Amen? Amen? So it makes no sense, but it makes logical sense if you're somebody that doesn't embrace Jesus. You don't want the truth. You don't want the light because you are continuing to enjoy. You prefer. Your flesh wants to keep doing what it's been doing. You want to keep being what you've been being. And in this world, sometimes, I would say many times, it seems like that pays off. Sometimes it seems like crime pays. So if you avoid or reject Jesus, it seems like you might be able to avoid the light that shines and exposes your stuff. I'm here to tell you, you can't hide. <laughs> The things you insist on doing and the ways you insist on continuing to be are known. Not just knowable, they are known. There are two books at the throne of judgment. One that talks about everything you did and the other one that is the final ultimate verdict about your eternal existence. So it might make it easier for you to think you're getting away with all of your stuff. But no, it's known. It's not just knowable. Amen? The spiritual denial that this world is operating in. It won't work in the end. Amen? It won't work. The truth is ultimately undeniable and unavoidable. Amen? So what we're highlighting here what Jesus is highlighting is a fatal flaw that we all have and we only get saved from that fatal flaw when we go in and put a patch on that errant programming called the blood of Jesus that fatal flaw is that we lack God's sense of time God is timeless he's not moved by time he's not affected by time but in our case we are prisoners of the moment we make decisions based on what we can see now, what we can hear now, and how we feel now. Even if all of that is contradicted by what God says, we still drive straight through the red light because we're based on, we're basing it on, you know what? I drive through the red lights and nothing happens. So I must be okay. I mean, let's think about it. How many of you have decisions that you made in the past that landed you in trouble? Mm -hmm. Now, how many of you, looking back, would do something different if you could? At the time, you were captive with your past decisions. You were captive to what you thought you knew at the time, to what you felt at the time, and the way things looked. And here's what Jesus is saying. The real indictment here, at, despite what you all just said, what you all raised your hands for, the real indictment is even if some wise person, some loving person, had come to tell you what was right when you were making your wrong decision, you wouldn't have listened. You wouldn't have taken it. My guess is that it, in many of your situations, some loving and wise person did tell you what you should and shouldn't do, and you did what you wanted to do anyway. Am I right? Am I on somebody's street? Did I find your address? Amen, I'm, and I'm about to land this plane. Amen? You wouldn't have taken it. So as we think about these folks that are taking this world in the wrong direction, that running away from God, going further from the light and the truth, it's not all that shocking because you also wouldn't have listened. We are the exception. That's automatic default programming these folks are living off of. All the stuff that we think is so terrible, that's what happens with man. Didn't, if you go back, Noah, the world was going to hell in a handbasket quick. That's our default programming. We are the miracles. Are you hearing me? 
And so whatever example you were thinking of when I said that thing that you made a bad decision about and would you do it differently, whatever that thing is, it might be terrible, it might be horrible, you might still be living with the consequences of it. You might still be guilty for it. You might still be paying for it. And no matter what it is, it doesn't compare a little bit to the decision and the choice about what to do with Jesus. Amen. That is still, and it will always be the most important decision point in anybody's life. Whether you will be saved or not, whether you will accept Jesus or not. There is an iceberg in the water and you can't survive those waters. The waters of Revelation 20, you cannot survive them. There is an iceberg. We can argue over it, but I'm just telling you there is an iceberg. You may not want to see it. You might want to deny it. You might want to say, but I, when I get there, I can swerve around it. But you're just seeing the tip. I know you go based off what you know, what you feel, what you see. You're just seeing the tip. We're offering you a savior that sees the whole thing. So in love, he sends you that message. Please turn. Please change. You can't survive it, not without the blood of Jesus. Now, I know I made that reference to basically the Titanic, right? But sadly, the Titanic, whether you were saved from it or not, once the ship hit the iceberg and now we knew we were in trouble, on the Titanic, you got saved based on class. The people in steerage weren't even allowed to get saved. In the Titanic, you were saved based on wealth. On the Titanic, if you were a woman, you were more likely to be put in the lifeboat than if you were a man. On the Titanic, if you were, if you were one of the ship's staff, you were less likely to be saved than the rest of the people because that was your obligation to keep them safe, and you had failed it. On the Titanic, there was a respecter of persons. On the Titanic, there was good and bad. On the Titanic, there were those who were favored and those who were not. On the Titanic. But the salvation that Jesus died for, the salvation that Jesus brought to us is available to Oh, there is an iceberg in the water. You can't survive it. And Jesus says everybody in this boat can be saved. You may not accept it. You may not embrace it. But that is the universal offering. It's not universally applied because it's not universally embraced. And you're here today. And you're here listening to this truth. And so if you're not saved, I suggest that you act on this truth today while you can. I may be speaking to an entirely saved audience, and hallelujah for that if that's the case. All of y'all say, yeah, come and get me, Lord. I realize I got troubles. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah for that. But if you're not saved, if there's anybody that ever gets to watch this, if there's anyone here that's not saved, please know that God knows your flaws and he knows all about your stuff. And he died for you anyway. He came for your good. He came in love. He didn't come to condemn. He's coming to you because he knows your default programming. Not to wag his finger about your default programming. But if you don't accept his offering, you're wagging the finger at yourself. You have a choice. He's not here to beat you up. So my recommendation is that you repent, metanoio, that you repent and move toward the light as opposed to away from the light. He died to set us free. So if you're not saved, let Jesus rescue you. It may not look like you're in trouble, but it might not have looked like you're in trouble with a lot of things you did and you think you got away with. But I'm telling you, there's an iceberg in the water. The folks on the Titanic were partying hard. The unsinkable ship sunk. And if you're living according to your own will, if you're living according to your own plan, and if you think you can rock and roll like that and get away with it eternally, just think the Titanic. Hallelujah. So 
if there's anybody in here today that's not saved, then this message is like, whoa, I get it. If there's anybody in here, and I don't think there is any in here in my physical presence that are not saved, you can just raise your hand right now. If there's anybody online that's not saved, you have not grabbed that, that uh, life preserver. You have not allowed Jesus to come into the waters of your life and to save you. you and, and you now realize that you are drowning and you need his solution. You need his love in your life. Then please put that in the chat and we will get with you. And if you've made that choice, feel free right now to embrace Jesus and say, you know what? I am so sorry. You don't need any fancy words. You don't have to quote me. In your own words, just say, I am so sorry. Do like the thief on the cross did. Oh, my God, I get it now. It's not too late for you. I am so sorry. Come into my life. You can say that or anything like it. He understands. I embrace you. I realize my default programming. I want to live my life for you now. Thank you for saving me. And then get with a group of believers. And if you don't know how to do that, keep tuning in on Sundays or go to FGG, www.fggministries.org and we will help you. We're not trying to necessarily have you come here. It may not even be convenient for you to do so, but we will make sure to help you along your journey because you were created on purpose with a purpose. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Isn't God good? Isn't this truth juicy? Isn't that a good meal? That's the foundation. All of this, we want you to understand all of it from Genesis to Revelation, from the Torah to the historical books to the poetic books to the prophetic books to the gospels to all the letters and the book of Revelation. We want you to get all that. But what we talked about last week and this week is your foundation upon which you stand. So if you don't remember any of the rest of it, you got something for people. You have the compassion of God. You have the plan of God. You, I ain't mad at you of God. You messing your own self up. I'm not mad at you. I came to save you. You just have to know you need to be saved and you have to want to be saved. Amen. It's as simple as that. And to God be the glory. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Hallelujah.